Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. Kuma told us that when you want to look at uh, algebraic numbers, what you should be looking at is factorization theory in a more general setting of ideals. That was his ideal rescue plan. And to do this uh, ideal uh, factorization, we're going to actually have to introduce the notion of invertible ideals because in this setting, when we look at invertible ideals, the theory of factorization mimics what you see for the factorization of numbers uh, that are integers. Okay, so let's firstly come with a definition of invertible ideals. So the setting we want to look at is R here is a commutative domain, and as such it has a fraction field, we'll call that K. And we'll start by looking at the notion of a fractional ideal. Okay, so an R module of the form all R multiples of some given alpha, alpha non-zero non fraction, uh, non-zero element of K cross, all such elements, uh, that's called a principal fractional ideal. If alpha here actually happens to be inside R, that's the usual principal ideal, but this alpha can be in the fraction field, so we call it a principal, fraction, pr principal fractional ideal. Any R submodule of such a uh, R module is called a fractional ideal. Okay, so suppose now we're given a fractional ideal, so that's just some R submodule of K now. Okay, so what we can do is we define something called I inverse. Okay, so what's I inverse? So I inverse is going to be uh, related to I as follows. You're going to look at all elements alpha inside this K, all these fractions alpha, such that when you multiply I by this alpha, it lands inside this uh, integral domain R. Okay, so that's the notion of this inverse. Okay, so you're multiplying things so that you're back inside R. Okay, so maybe just to keep a, a simple example of this. Okay, so inside Z. Okay, if you look inside there, you've got the ideal two. So this is a, a principal ideal. It's also uh, a, uh, a principal fractional ideal. Hence, if you want to look at all, uh, the inverse here. Okay, what's that equal to? Well, this is all the uh, rational numbers such that when you multiply by any even number, okay, you get an integer. And of course, they're just the, all the multiples of half, integer multiples of half, okay. So it's the principal fractional ideal generated by half here, okay. So that's an example of an I inverse, okay. And as you can see uh, here, it's just really capturing the notion of an inverse, okay. Here, the um, principal fractional ideal generated by two, its inverse is the principal fractional ideal generated by half, okay. So note that if you have i and you have this i inverse, where i is a fractional ideal, okay, uh, when you multiply, remember what this is, this is an r submodule of a k, and it's a sum of all products of an element from here and an element from here. Of course, since the multiplication is commutative, we can reverse the order of this. And since we've said that any product of anything in i with anything inside this inverse, by definition, lines inside r, you're summing things inside r, so this is always contained inside r. So this I, I inverse is always an actual ideal inside R, okay? And the definition of invertible is if you actually have equality holding here, okay, then we'll say that uh, this ideal is invertible and this I inverse is actually the inverse ideal, okay? So that's the notion of an inverse ideal. So here the uh, ideal generated by two is invertible and its inverse ideal is just the ge ideal generated by half okay so this is a fairly natural notion let's look at a more interesting case where we don't have principal fractional ideals uh, so let's look at the case where r is this uh, ring of integers z adjoined the square root of uh, minus five so maybe i'll just put the brackets around there so you can see you've adjoined this um, uh, uh, element there like that okay so in this ring, okay, remember we have this ideal, which is a maximal ideal, in fact, that's generated by 3 and 1 plus square root of minus 5. Okay, so this is not a principal ideal. Okay, and um, let's try to work out what is the inverse of this. And I want to show you an interesting element that's in the inverse of this. It's going to be 1 minus the square root of uh, minus 5 divided by 3. Okay, so it's, this element here is certainly not inside R, it's not an integer linear combination of 1 and square root of minus 5. Okay, but I claim it's inside I inverse. Okay, so to check that it's inside I inverse, what I need to do, I need to check that if I multiply this by anything inside I, so anything generated by these two, I'm in, I, I get something that's inside this R, this ring of integers. Of course, to check that, I just need to sh show that 3 times this and 1 plus square root of minus 5 times this is inside R because remember all the elements inside here are just R linear combinations of these so if those two are inside R, those products 
uh, with this alpha or inside r, then so is any r linear combination of those two. Okay, so let's check this. So let's multiply this alpha by 3 first. That just clears the denominator to get 1 minus square root of minus 5. That's clearly inside r. The more interesting thing is what happens when I multiply 1 plus square root of minus 5 with this alpha. So on the top, I guess, the numerator here is the complex conjugate of that. So I'll get the square root of the modulus. So that's 1 minus negative 5 is 6. And in the denominator, I have 3. So 6 on 3 is equal to 2. And that's also inside r. Okay, so we see that actually this is an element inside i inverse. In fact, what's interesting here is that what uh, is another element that clearly is inside I um, inverse? Well, this I is actually an ideal, so that means that when you multiply by 1, it stays inside here, and particularly inside R. So 1 is inside there. And in fact, if you look at the R submodule of the fraction field K, generated by 1, and this element alpha, 1 minus square root of negative 5 divided by 3, you'll get all of I inverse. This is actually not something that's difficult to compute and to check, okay? You can look at any uh, uh, integer linear combination of 1 and square root of, uh, or not integer, rational linear combination of 1 and square root of minus 5. They're the elements of this fraction field. And say, what hap what's the condition such that when you multiply by 3 and 1 plus square root of minus 5, you stay inside this R here, okay? And you'll find that everything ha can be written as an R linear combination of these two. Okay, and I claim that actually that this is actually the inverse because i is invertible. Okay, so uh, I want to show that this is invertible. So remember, i i inverse is always contained inside r, and it's always going to be an ideal as well. So to check that it equals r, you just have to show that it contains one. Okay, so let's see why it contains one. Okay, so what does it contain? You can look at sums of products of elements. Okay, so you can take something in i like three here and something in i inverse like one here, multiply those two, and you'll get that inside. So it contains three. And we also saw that well, this is the alpha here, and you can multiply this alpha in this i inverse with this 1 plus square, square root of minus 5, and we saw that answer is 2. So you've also, it also contains 2, 3 and 2, so it contains also the difference, so it contains 1. Okay, so that tells you that i times i inverse equals r. Okay, so this is actually the inverse fractional idea. Okay, fractional idea, remember, is because it's now got fractions involved in there. Okay, so one very nice fact about invertible ideals that we'll need to know is that any invertible ideal is actually finitely generated. And the proof for this is rather nice. We can, all, in some ways, find this um, uh, finite set of generators. Okay, uh, okay, so why is that? So remember, what does it mean to be invertible? That means i times i inverse is equal to the ring itself. So in particular, the most important thing is it contains 1. If it contains 1, that means that 1 is inside here, so you can write it as a sum of products, one from here and one from here. So let's write it as the sum rj times alpha j, where rj are elements of the ideal i, and these alpha j are elements inside the inverse ideal i inverse. Okay, so that's great. Now I claim that all the rj's that occur here, all these elements inside the ideal, they actually generate this ideal. And let's check why that's true. So suppose you have any ring inside ring element um, R, which is inside that I. Okay. Well, that's equal to R times 1. So I can multiply this element by R. So I'll write it as the sum of the RJ. And I'll put the R in the middle here, R times alpha J. R is inside I. And alpha J are inside I inverse. So when you multiply these two, you're inside the ring R. So this is an R linear combination of these RJ. So it's in the uh, ideal generated by R1 up to RS. Okay, so that's a very quick proof and it shows you rather nicely that any invertible ideal is actually finitely generated. In fact, you can say a lot more about this sort of thing. This also plays a role in Morita theory as well. Okay, so these things are seen in other uh, contexts as well. Okay, so that's about invertible ideals, but that raises the re um, natural question. Okay, how is it related to this idea of factorization of ideals? and more generally this notion of divisibility. So let me explain that to you right now. Okay, so suppose that you have j and i are fractional ideals, okay, and suppose j is invertible. So in this situation we said that j divides i, and we write with well, the usual symbols j divides i. So if you're familiar with this theory of uh, Euclidean domains, okay, then uh, this is uh, something that you should well know. Okay, so you, what you want to do there in that theory of uh, Euclidean domains is you want to replace the notion of one element dividing another one with the containment, the reverse containment 
of the ideals generated by those uh, two. So that's a natural uh, generalization of this sort of uh, situation. But here you can say a little bit more, okay? So you can really talk about divides. Why is that? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this K. I'm going to define it as J inverse times I. Okay, so you're looking at sums of products of elements, one from J inverse, one from I. And I firstly claim that this is uh, contained inside R. Okay, so remember this will be an ideal. Um, uh, so firstly it's closed under scalar multiplication by elements of R because J inverse is, okay, or I is, okay, so there are two ways to see that it's actually closed under that. Um, and I guess, uh, so that tells you, and, and I guess the other thing that you need to see is that it's actually inside R. So why is that? So what's J inverse mean? So to be inside J inverse means that you can multiply anything. If you take something inside J inverse, you multiply it with anything inside J, and particularly anything inside I, will land you back inside R. So it is inside R. All the products here are inside R, and since, hence so is that sum of such products inside R. So this is an ideal inside R. And let's look at J times K. If you look at J times K, let's write out what it is. It's J times J inverse I. And J, J inverse is just R. So R times I, of course, is just R. So in this case, we've really factorized this I as this ideal J, or this fractional ideal J, uh, times this uh, K. And K here is an actual honest ideal. Okay, and in particular, if I is actually an ideal and J is actually an ideal, okay, then you have a factorization of this ideal as a product of those two ideals. Okay, so in this sense, it really divides, okay, in the sense that if you multiply this J, the bigger one, with this actual ideal of R, you get the smaller fractional ideal. Okay, so that suggests that um, if we play around with invertible ideals, then we have a nice notion of divides because it really corresponds to the fact that you can factorize an ideal. Okay, so we're going to make this following definition. Okay, um, this commutative domain R is said to be a Dedekind domain if for every non-zero ideal I inside R, it's actually invertible. Okay, so let's look at some effects of this uh, definition. So proposition two tells you a very, very nice consequence of this. Suppose R is a Dedekind domain and you have P is some non-zero prime inside R, then P actually has to be a maximal. So there's no distinction really between maximals and primes unless of course uh, you get this, except for the fact that you get this extra prime which is zero. But other than that, okay, uh, the primes are the same things as maximals. Okay, and it's quite easy to prove this. Uh, I can give the proof in these two lines. Okay, suppose P is not maximal, that means you can stick an ideal in between R and inside P. Okay, so what happens now? So um, as we did up uh, over here, we have a containment, right? So we can factorize this P into uh, this J and this J inverse P. So this J here is an ideal. And as we saw up there, J inverse P is another ideal as well. So we have product of two ideals is equal to that. In particular, it's contained inside this. So that means that one of these factors has to be inside P. And we're assuming it's not J here, right? So it has to be the other one. So J inverse P is contained inside P. Okay, so let's see how that's going to give us a contradiction. Because remember, we want to show that we couldn't do this. We couldn't fit in a bigger ideal uh, J unless it was equal to R. Okay, so we need, we've, we've used this part here. Now we want to show basically a contradiction by saying that J has to equal R. So let's see what R is. Well, R I can write as J times J inverse, because that's R, times another R written as P times P inverse. Now, J inverse P, remember, from this argument here is contained inside P. So I can replace the middle two with just the P. I can get rid of the J inverse, so it's J, P, P inverse. And P, P inverse is R, so J times this R is equal to J. And if you look at this equality here, this ideal J is such that R is contained inside J. So R equals J, and that gives you your contradiction. Okay, so it has to be maximal. Okay, so that's right, rather nice. If you have this Dedekind domain situation here, in other words, if every non-zero ideal is invertible, okay, then you know that the primes have to be either zero or the maximals. Okay? So the most thing, important thing, and this is a theorem, I won't go through the whole proof today, um, but if you have R is a Dedekind domain, then in fact uh, you are in the situation of a commerce ideal rescue plan. Any ideal I 
can be uniquely factorized into a product of primes. Okay? And the part that's easiest to prove though um, today, which I will do, is to uh, do the uniqueness. Okay, so the existence I'll do in the next video, and that's because it most naturally uh, introduces a new concept that of the ascending chain condition. Um, but for the uniqueness, we can actually just copy the proof that we saw uh, for the unique factorization of integers, okay, into primes. Okay, so let me just show you how uniqueness works here. Uh, we can assume that this prime, of course, is not zero, okay, because zero is already a prime. And suppose you have some idea i, and you can factorize it in two different ways, okay? So p1, p2 up to pr, they're all primes, or also q1, q2 up to qs, they're all primes, okay? So normally what would you do, okay? So normally what you do is say something like, well, one of these primes has to match up with one of the primes on the other side, okay? So let's pick up this one here. This q1 has to match up one of the other ones. So how do we do that argument now? So the way we'll do that is, well, this product, of course, is, well, this is something in r times q1, so this is contained inside q1. So you have a product of ideals that's contained inside Q1, okay? And now we want to pick one of these to say it has to equal this Q1, okay? So why is that true? Because uh, the fact that this Q1 is prime, okay, means that if you have a product that's contained inside there, that, that one of these uh, factors has to be contained inside here. And without loss of generality, we can re-index this so that we can say that P1 is an ideal that's contained inside Q1. Now P1 here is a, a prime. And it's going to be, we're assuming we're not in the zero case, so P1 is non-zero, okay? And so by proposition two, it's maximal. So actually P1 has to equal Q1. P1 equals Q1 like that. So that's rather nice. This is just like the case when you want to prove the unique factorization of uh, integers into primes, okay? So we've uh, matched up uh, a common prime on either side. And now the thing you want to do is you just want to cancel out those two primes. And how do we cancel? So normally, I guess you use division, okay? That's something that you can do. And in this case, why can we use division? Well, what we do instead is we multiply by the inverse. Since P1 and Q1 are invertible, that's easy enough to do. So let's just see formally how, how that works. Okay, so if we look at this expression here, we can multiply this I by P1 inverse. And of course, when you put a P1 inverse here, P1 inverse times this P1 is R. So R times this is just P2 down to PR. So we've basically cancelled off the P1 by multiplying this ideal by P1 inverse. But P1 inverse also, P1 equals Q1. So that's the same as multiplying by Q1 inverse. And if you multiply this expression on the right by Q1 inverse, you'll cancel this Q1 and you get Q2 down to QS. And now what you can say is that, well, just by induction on the number of factors on one of the sides, you can see that this uh, product of primes has to equal this product of primes over here. And hence you get uniqueness of the factorization of any ideal into a product of primes. Okay? So in this way, we can see that by introducing this notion of invertible ideals and asserting that you know, all the ideals you're playing around with are invertible, we can really mimic a lot of what we do with factorization theory of integers for this ideal situation. Okay? And it's partly because uh, this invertible ideal means that you can really invert and you can really cancel off products by some sort of an ideal. Okay? And there are also some more subtle things that are going on here as well. So this um, distinction between, uh, before that you have between maximals and primes, okay? uh, at least if you throw away zero, this distinction uh, disappears. Okay? And that's partly uh, using this as assertion, this hypothesis that R is a dedicate domain. So all the uh, ideals which are not zero are actually invertible. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.